All right, we're at the last session of day one. Let's hear it for that. Come on. All right. All right, so who wants a really boring, um, slow-moving session? Or who want... All right, we got two people right there. You guys can leave this. I'm sure. So I, I was going to do pretty much a straight run-of-the-mill session. Decided, uh, is this volume okay, by the way? I decided to have a little fun. Um, not too much fun, though. It's only day one, right? We have to save the real fun for later. But I'm going to tell you a story about Bob. And, um, well, let's tell the story about Bob. So this is Bob. So anybody know Bob personally? Yeah, Richard does. He's a, he's a Bob fan. So Bob has a story. So it's probably not unlike your story. So how many people here are running SharePoint 2010? All right. How many are thinking maybe someday, whether tomorrow or a year from now, you're going to go to 2013? You're in the right room. All right, that's a good start. All right, Bob had the same problem. So let's talk about Bob. So why is Bob sad? Bob is sad because he deployed 2010 and felt like a superhero. How many of you felt that way when you deployed 2010, right? Yeah, that, it was that good. He felt really good him about himself, right? Except he started hearing, you know, murmurs here and there from the business. Not, not necessarily bad. And he was curious as to know, you know, what's going on here. And so he's, he's kind of thinking, well, what's the problem? So he found out his users actually wanted more SharePoint, which was an interesting thing because uh, that means it's a successful rollout, right? The trick was, though, they wanted it to be better. So at, simultaneously, they said, these cookies taste a little off, but can I have a few more dozen? Because I like them, right? It, he, it was sort of mixed messages. Anybody here get sort of those mixed messages a little bit? Yeah, I thought so. So basically, he thought, hey, I just went to the SharePoint conference. I bet 2013 will solve all my problems. Because he saw a killer keynote. How many people saw the killer keynote? Exactly. So I'm going to take you down off that ledge, not the ledge, the cloud, no pun intended, and, and actually talk some sense into you about things you want to think about and then things you could do now to prep for that 2013 rollout. So this is what Bob did. He said, hey, 2013 is going to help us. But then he realized quickly he really didn't know how to go, you know, how to proceed. And the reason was, Certain things worked in his 2010 rollout, and certain things didn't, and he didn't want to repeat the same mistakes in the 2013 rollout. All right? So let's talk through what Bob should or should not do. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. And by the way, I, I noticed that charting was in the title of the session. We're not doing any BI here, if that's okay. All right. This is, at, this is cartography, not necessarily uh, reporting, right? All right, so let's help Bob and take him through his journey. So. Basically, uh, so I'm Scott Jamison. I'm the CEO and Chief Architect at Jornada. We have a booth in the session. I'm also um, what's called an MCA and MVP. I think Jeff mentioned it this morning, and an MVP as well. And I've got this book, SharePoint 2010. Has anybody ever seen this book before? So I'm going to give one away in this session, if you haven't seen it before. And I'll also give away a copy of SharePoint 20, uh, Essential SharePoint 2013, which I do not have yet. It will be published probably early next year, but I'll give you both. So I'll give you this one to take with you one lucky person in this room, and then I'll give you a, how about a promise to give you the next one when it comes out. How's that? And I keep my promises, right, Richard? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, so let's chart Bob's 2013 journey. All right, so let's break it down into four key sections. Number one, he wants to find out if all the investment he made in 2010 was a waste, right? And so the first question is, can we leverage anything we did in 2010 or not? The second question is, what do I have to think about in the context of what is new in 2013? That's the second section. And then the third section is, what can we do today to start preparing for the inevitable march to 2013, right? So even if I'm not, let's say, going to roll it out for three months, six months, a year, whatever, what can I be doing on a day-to-day -day basis to make my life easier in that six months or year when I actually do roll out 2013? And then finally, let's talk about what your SharePoint journey is and what that looks like and, and what I mean by your SharePoint journey. All right, so making the most of today's investment. So today's investment, right? So what have you invested in? Let's pick a few things. You have a topology, right? You're managing your own farm. How many people are actually running SharePoint 2010 in the cloud right now? All right, so we have a couple people. Everybody else is on-premise, I assume? All right, so you've made an investment in 2010, right? So you've got a topology. That's your servers, your infrastructure, et cetera. You've got your logical architecture, 
right? So you came up with some web apps, some site collections, all kinds of things like that. You have platform dependencies. So you're investing in certain software dependencies, hardware dependencies on that topology, et cetera. And then users, you've probably already trained users to use SharePoint. So they're used to clicking certain buttons and looking at web parts and things like that. Is that going to be a problem? And then developers within the organization are probably developing things on the platform. So what do we need to consider there in, in terms of that investment? So let's take those one at a time. So the good news is that SharePoint 2013, same basic topology. Who is in um, Bill Baer's IT pro session today, right? So he went over the fact that same basic topology. You've got pretty much web front ends, app servers, and SQL servers. That doesn't change. However, a couple of things do change. The Office web app servers that you used to be able to just spin up because they were a service application in SharePoint, they're actually, not only are they a separate thing now, they're not even part of SharePoint anymore, but you have to run them on a separate physical server. Now, when I say physical server, sort of using that term loosely, technically you can run them on a, se a separate virtual server that are both hosted on the same physical host, right? But you actually have to consider that in your topology now. So if you're running one big honkin' server with SharePoint and Office Web Apps now, that's actually going to be broken into two servers in the future, or four if you want redundancy, et cetera, right? So that's one thing you're going to think of. There's also a new server that gets added to the mix called the Workflow Manager Server. And that's because Workflow has been broken out of SharePoint as well. So SharePoint 2013 Workflow is not really SharePoint 2013 Workflow. It's really Azure Workflow, technically. And the official name is a Workflow Manager Server is the type of server you're going to need there. So that can actually run and coexist with SharePoint servers, but you'll need to make a decision whether you want to run those on the same box or not. Right? And we won't get into the super gory details here, but again, things to start considering. The good news, how many people run fast with their 2010 environment? Okay, so we got maybe 10%, 20%, something like that. Now with fast, you have to run fast on a separate couple of servers than you do your SharePoint search servers and the rest of your SharePoint search farm, uh, SharePoint farm, correct? Yeah. Well, because SharePoint 2013 combines fast and SharePoint search into one SharePoint search engine, you can actually get rid of those extra servers, if you will, although you're going to want to think about what does your search topology look like, right? So this is just some guidelines around, okay, what does my topology look like now? What's it going to need to look like if I continue to host this in-house? Now, one of the things you're going to want to do, though, is when you do go to 2013, build a completely separate farm, fresh, and then take your databases and move them over and upgrade, right? So don't try to upgrade in place. You know why? There's no option to do that anyway, okay? So you're going to want to think about having extra capacity, at least for the build-out, and then you'll actually be able to regain the use of your current 2010 farm uh, after you've fully migrated. All right, so that's topology. So we've got you know, web servers, we've got uh, app servers, we've got query servers and index servers for the search, we've got databases, and then we've got the office web app servers. What about logical architecture? Same logical architecture. The nice things, this doesn't change at all, including service applications. One of the things that changed in every single release of SharePoint since the beginning has been the service application architecture. Except for SharePoint 2013, it actually stays the same for once. All the other metaphors that you're thinking of in terms of logical architecture, what is a farm, what is a web app, what is a site collection, those all stay exactly the same. So if you've got, for example, right now, one proxy group with three uh, web applications and they all share the services, you can continue uh, you know, designing your farm exactly like that. Right? What about platform dependencies? Well, SharePoint 2013 requires Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1 as well as SQL Server 2008 R2 SP1. So again, just from a planning perspective, you'll probably just need to upgrade your operating system choice by a, either an, R, an R2 or an R1 you know, and a service pack. Or you can go to the Windows 2012 SQL 2012. Now, the one thing that has changed is the memory requirement in production for a web front end. Can you believe it's actually 8 gig for SharePoint 2010? How many people actually run their production SharePoint server with 8 gig? I'm curious. Three people, exactly. How many people in your company? Or how many users? 600, that's impressive. How many over there? 1,100, with eight, eight gig? No performance issues? Three front ends, okay. Do they ever upload a file, ever? <laughs> Just checking. Okay, the, the actual requirement now is 12 gig 
on a web front end. That's actually a new requirement in 2013. But even 12 gig is low. And what's interesting is that you'll actually get better memory usage in 2013 because of things like shredded storage and this distributed cache that the um, news feed uses and things like that. Although you will get more demand on memory because of things like the social news feed. So interesting memory requirement, just something to note there. OK, what about UX metaphors? Well, UX metaphors stay the same except for one big thing. How many people have seen 2013, how you actually create a new list in 2013? Has anybody ever seen that? It's actually not a list technically anymore. It's an app called a list. This will probably confuse users. Right? So this is definitely something you're going to need to uh, think about in terms of your rollout is, do users need to be retrained on what it means to provision things like lists and libraries and sites and pages? Right? Because it's going to have a different metaphor where, actually, let me go in here and do a little quick uh, showing you uh, in 2013. If I go into, for example, a new site here, let's see how this performs. Do, 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 do. So let's just go into a team site. So if I go into, for example, uh, my site contents, and I want to create a new list as a user, notice that I'm adding an app. That's actually the new metaphor for users to create a new library. It's not create new document library. It's add an app. And which app do I want to add? Of course, I want to add the app called document library. And when I do that, it's like creating a new document library in SharePoint 2010. So it's not that difficult, but it is different, right? So it, it may be something that, again, you're leveraging most of the same um, sort of um, metaphor, right, except for this app concept that users will have to get used to. Make sense? You guys good with that? <laughs> exactly. That's my point, is that it will get users confused. So it's something you have to think about. How will that affect people? And that's why I put at the bottom, additional training required, maybe, right? Depends on who uses our Same developer tools, again, almost. Visual Studio SharePoint Designer, except Design View in SharePoint Designer goes away. And there's a new tool. Who's, who's heard of Napa? So there's a new web-based tool called Napa for Office 365. If you think of Visual Studio way on one end of the spectrum for hardcore developers, you could think of Napa sort of closer to the power user spectrum where they're creating custom applications, maybe in the middle, maybe not too far on the, on the user spectrum on that side. But you can actually create custom solutions for the cloud is, is really what it's targeted for in the browser. And behind the scenes, it's doing some interesting uh, development work for you. All right, so net result, mostly you're, you're able to uh, you know, leverage that existing investment from a you know, hardware infrastructure, logical architecture perspective, um, except you're going to have to get your head around the app metaphor mainly. Right? That's the big one there. All right, what about what's new in 2013? Well, we already talked about a few things that are new. Let's talk about four key areas right, that are really major investments. So number one is social. Right? Social is a big one because you've got um, a much richer microblogging and news feed um, functionality available to users. Right? And what that's going to mean to you from an infrastructure perspective is there's a lot more usage of personal sites. Why is that? And the reason it is is how many people have rolled out um, user profiles? Okay? Probably you know, 80% or 70%. What about personal sites where they can actually store files? OK, so that's not only like 25%. Well, here's the big thing about that in 2013. You have to give people the ability to store content in their My Site if you turn on social, because instead of, in 2010, what happened was all the social news feed and other social information actually went into one database, which was called the social database, and that was part of the user profile service application, right? Now, the individual news feed content, actually your, your personal news feed, so Richard, your news feed actually goes into your my site in the content database where your my site is stored. Which is good news in that I, if I have 100,000 users, I can spread those across many, many, many content databases, and I'm not um, you know, constrained by this single point of you know, um, smallness, if you will, unscalability, which is the profile um, social database that exists in 2010. Okay? So that's a big deal now, because now I have to allocate 
personal storage for individual users when I never had to do that anymore, uh, before. All right? So you have to think about that. How much, how much content is going to go in there? Well, now you have to start doing some calculations, right? depending on how much activity you're going to have, if you turn social on at all. How many people, when they go to 2013, think they're going to enable social features? Curious. Well, that's about half the room. So definitely consideration there. Now, of course, these considerations don't exist if you move into the cloud, right? Because the idea is that Microsoft is taking care of some of those types of things. All right, retention and compliance. Well, because there's a lot of information being stored now, you're going to have to start thinking about all of this social information. What are you going to do with it? How do you track it? And is compliance going to come into effect? What's interesting in you know, 2010, the issue you had is that all the content in SharePoint, just about all of it, is essentially in a list or a library, right, except social information. And that still holds true. Social information does not get stored in the same way that other content gets stored. There's also new privacy settings, things like um, what should people see. So who can follow my documents? Can everyone follow my documents? Can only my manager? So just like the profiles now in SharePoint 2010 where it says, hey, only my boss can see my cell phone number. There are another dozen privacy settings that you'll have to think about around who can follow me and who can follow my information, et cetera. So don't just roll social out without thinking about these you know, uh, configuration settings. And then from a governance perspective, what should users do? What should they do? What can't they do? And what must they do, right? So you know, they, they have to do certain things. They should do other things. This is really what governance is about at the end of the day, right? And we'll get back to governance in a second. All right, mobile's another big one. So in addition to social, mobile's a big consideration. We're seeing, at least me and my organization, we're seeing a huge uptick in organizations wanting to um, use mobile in the context of SharePoint, right? And the nice thing about SharePoint 2013 is there's a lot more support for mobile. Things like, you know, do I get a classic view in a regular browser? It, it can detect, actually, you, you have a mobile client, and you can target different form factors for different size mobile de um, devices, which is nice. Um, but in, again, in doing that, you have a few things that you need to think about, which is the whole bring your own device concept is actually gaining a lot of popularity in organizations. So how many people are actually in IT supporting SharePoint right now? Probably two thirds of the, uh, of the room. You'll start needing to start think. Uh, you'll start needing to think about if you haven't already. What is the implication of having to support many, many mobile devices, or do I standardize on one device? Right. The other thing you're going to need to think about is: Does anybody use short names on their intranet, for example? Not fully qualified. Mm, about six or eight of you. One of the challenges we see when that happens is that. Somebody says, hey, I want to start using you know, some documents and intranet or whatever on my mobile device, whatever, and I don't want to have to VPN in, so let's change our you know, model where let's just poke a hole out through the internet and we'll just get right in. Right? The issue with that is a short name won't work. Right? You have to make sure you have a fully qualified domain name that's mapped in the alternate access mappings and actually able you know, for SharePoint to resolve that and, and feed that content out. And frankly, users more and more are expecting mobile to work. So in 2010, mobile really wasn't a first-class citizen. And in 2013, good thing it is. The issue then is, will mobile be the thing that drives you to 2013 more rapidly? And if so, you have to be aware of you know, some of these um, issues. All right, search. Search is a, a big deal. So how many people think SharePoint 2013 search will fix all their search ills? Uh, nice try. No. Here's the thing. How many people have rolled out search? Curious. All right. How many people think search works like perfectly? No issues ever. OK. It's all your fault, by the way. And here's why. User information that users maintain leads to bad search results probably 90% of the time. So I'm blaming it on you. This guy in the front row, I'm blaming it right on you right there. And I will prove it. OK, so you're agreeing with me. Oh, OK, you're agreeing with me. OK. I was going to come down and have to pick a fight or something, so no. So you're, you're nodding your head yes, which is the actual issue. And it's not even that hard. And I'll actually demonstrate where SharePoint 2013 improves search immensely. And it actually makes it so much easier to find the thing you're, you know, you're looking for. But there's still fundamental problems with 
just the quality of the content itself that I want you to all try to address before you go to 2013, and I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So what do you need to think about? Well, search topology is gonna change. Again, if you rolled out fast before, even if you didn't roll out fast, you're gonna have to start thinking about what your search topology looks like because you know, search in 2013 is great, it's complex, it's rich, but it can get complex, right? Depending on the scale of your infrastructure and your you know, corpus size and things like that. How many people have heard of the content search web part? Okay. How many people love the idea? Okay, so here's the interesting thing. I love the content search web part, and there's one issue with it, and I'll tell you what it is in a second. But, so the content query web part and the content search web part are pretty much joined at the hip, and they kind of do the same thing, which is aggregate content, right? But they do it in slightly different ways. The content query web part deterministically runs a query against one or more lists inside the context of a site collection, so you can't go outside site collections, and it says, give me the stuff that matches this query directly against the content. So it's real time, right? I'm guaranteed to get accurate results, and it works pretty well unless I'm searching against you know, immense amounts of data, which is, which is potentially an issue, but it, it works great. The biggest single limitation of the content uh, uh, query web part is what? Can't go across site collections, exactly. So here comes content search web part to the rescue. You can play some dramatic music here, right? And what happens is, instead of going directly at the content, it goes at the index, which has crawled all the site collections in the SharePoint environment. So the, now the nice thing is I can actually issue a query, just like I would against the content query web part, except I'm issuing it not against the content directly, but against this index. And the nice thing now is I can aggregate content across site collections. Here's the issue with it is that you have to go to the index and then you have to, for any information you don't have, you have to go read the item, et cetera. So one of the problems with uh, content query, uh, content search web part is that it can, at large scale, impact performance if you're not careful. So you have to plan for it. And this is where those two web parts alone, content query and content search, are immensely powerful and give the IT staff that manages SharePoint a headache. Because it's a nightmare to try to estimate and anticipate what the usage of that thing will be. In fact, the Office 365 team is so afraid of it, it's turned off in Office 365. Did everybody know that? You can't do content search web parts in Office 365. And Microsoft will probably come find me and kill me right now for telling you that, but um, it's true. Okay, search, central to the user experience. It is more and more expected by users to not only to be there and available in every application, but also that it works well. And this is where part of your job is, before you even go to 2013, I don't care if you're moving next week, is use that as an opportunity to educate users as much as you can, right, on how what they do will actually impact search results, either positively or negatively, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. All right, one more thing. So I went through what? Uh, social, went through search. Uh, what else did I go through? Mobile. Exactly, mobile. Thank you. Just mean if you're paying attention. And then the last one I'm going to go through, business solutions. So why is business solutions on the list? Well, a classic IT thing has been business users that say, hey, I need this application that tracks information X, Y, and Z. Hey, IT team, can you build this for me? Right? And the development team and, you know, within IT says, yeah, of course, it'll take you know, three people three months. You know, and, and the person says, but I need it like the day after tomorrow, actually. So what do the people in, in, the, in the business do? What do they use? Access or Excel, right? Of course they do, because they have to get their job done. So how many people have heard of Access Services? So in SharePoint 2010, Access services was this thing you could actually create an access database, point it at SharePoint, and it would, re it would put all those tables into SharePoint as server-side lists, which is nice, because now you have backup happening, it's multi-user, you have a web interface, they're in SharePoint lists, which is good or bad, depending on your point of view. But it's not really scalable for the long run. If you're gonna put millions of transactions in there, a SharePoint list is probably not the best place. So how is access services different in 2013? The main difference? Those don't go into SharePoint lists anymore. Those actually go into SQL database tables. Technically, they go into SQL Azure tables, but you can either host that yourself or put it in the cloud. The beautiful thing about that is you can take an access database, now you have a basically a web app talking to SQL, and yes, you can hit those tables directly if you want. 
So what's interesting is you can actually take an Axis database you know, from you know, Axis 97, if you want, bring it up to uh, Axis 2013, point it at SharePoint, it'll create Azure databases for you, and now you've got basically a web app, right? Which is, which is pretty amazing. Big deal for IT, you know why, if you're the SharePoint admin? If you see this starting to gain traction, this is again going to be an administrative thing here because you'll have to think about, well, how does it impact my topology? Now I'm going to have to have access servers for service applications, and I'm going to think about SQL Azure. Do I bring that in-house? Do I run that in the cloud? How does that work? Who's going to manage my database growth and all that, right? Is, is that a DBA? Is that me? And then how does the empowerment of power users work? What is the governance policies there around people basically pointing access to databases at my SharePoint environment? That sounds really scary. Do I want that to happen or not? Right? But that can enable some amazing you know, productivity and solutions. So again, net result. Identify, I, I only named four of probably the 20 or 30 investment areas in SharePoint 2013, but those are probably the, the biggest four that will impact you. And you want to identify where 2013 is going to make the biggest impact and then target those places, right? And then anticipate how that's going to impact your environment. All right, so what can you do today? We're going till five, right? Or maybe we'll end a little early because, you know, it's the last session of the day. So, all right, things to prepare now. So what can you do today? So I'm going to give you five general areas that I want you to start doing today. How many people aren't going to migrate to 2013 ever? Just checking. What? Nobody raised their hand. That's actually impressive. I was expecting at least a few people. Even if you don't, how many people are going to go within the next three months? Uh, six months. And nine months. And one year. And after one year. OK, so actually it's pretty evenly divided amongst all those time ranges. Um, so here's what I want you guys to be doing in over those next three, six, nine, 12, or 15 months or whatever, right? I want you to do these five things. Number one, I want you to organize, well, let me just jump in. Number one, I want you to work with your users to start organizing content better, right? And I know this doesn't necessarily fall on IT, but it does in that if we want SharePoint to be a great environment, we want to work directly with the users hand in hand and actually supply a great support system and recommendations on how they should do things. So first of all, how many people proactively give users guidance about whether they should use metadata or folders? OK, so about 20% of you. What do the other 80% of you do? OK, a whole lot of nothing. What's that? Just, just hand it over and say, yeah, go, go to town. I, I just support the servers, man, right? So, but what I'm saying is, what's interesting is everybody absolves themselves of who should be educating the users on this new paradigm. And the tricky part is we have a gap between the IT folks who run the environment and the actual business user community. And what I'm seeing is actually more and more, we're kind of moving up the food chain from an IT perspective. You know, I'm, I'm an IT guy that's been on IT forever. And here's why. If you think about running the servers and patching the servers and supplying them electricity and, you know, figuring out how much memory each server needs and sizing the databases. That's all really important work. But what's happening slowly is that folks like Microsoft and others are actually taking some of that responsibility and putting that into the cloud, for example, right? And what that's going to do is actually push the IT responsibility slightly more toward, well, how do we then make sure we're actually managing this in cooperation with the business to make sure they have a great environment? So again, start thinking about what is IT's role in your organization for that kind of activity. Default versus requested value. So what that means is I'm going to demand metadata columns from the user. How many people have used default values in SharePoint 2010? Anybody? Does anybody not know what those are? I can show you. Everybody knows what they are. OK, one guy. I'm going to show you just because you're one guy. So that actually is in um, SharePoint 2010 and SharePoint 2013, and it can be really useful. And I'll show you in one second why. Contributor versus consumer. So again, I recommend splitting your constituency when you design a site into consumer. So those are the people who grab things, and they don't care about the structure of anything, right? They just want to find what they need versus the contributor. And then you've got empowerment versus governance. So what do you just let people do, and then what do you try to lock down? So that's the difference there. So I just want to show you a quick example here inside of SharePoint. So this is actually SharePoint 2010. Does anybody actually have site? Oops, sorry. Does anybody have sites that actually look like this? 
So I spent all weekend designing this site, by the way. Do you like, do you like what I came up with? Um, by the way, that's my cousin Fred, and that's my sister. Uh, no, you guys know what this is. So what's the problem with the out-of-the-box metaphor? The problem is, if I need to go find something, right, I'm probably searching in, in like all these crazy places. I, the UI doesn't really change that much. I really can't find what I'm looking for, et cetera, right? So I'm looking around, et cetera. And the other problem is there's not a lot of metadata on this, so it's not helping me that you know, people upload this stuff and I'm not getting anywhere. So I'm looking for a document on procurement. I think it's probably under the project documents. And you know, there's procurement. Well, maybe it's a procedure. I don't know. So it's one of these documents, right? So what fixes this? Well, search fixes this, right? No, search doesn't fix this. Here's the thing. You want to start doing something like this if as much as you can, and again, this gets you know, a little bit where, does IT do this? Is this a um, information architecture thing? Well, it's mostly information architecture, but what is IT's role there? So I want you to start thinking about that, which is you want to start capturing information so I can start doing things like you know, metadata filtering, right? But the problem is getting people to put the metadata in is a challenge. So what I implore you to do is use folders in conjunction with metadata, where metadata columns are, are you know, designed first, and you don't need that many, you know, only need a few, right, to help you find things. But then if you create a corresponding folder structure, set default metadata there, which you can do in 2010 and 2013, so you're not gonna lose anything with the upgrade, then when a user uploads something into a folder which they're familiar with, they'll automatically get metadata assigned. And then people who look at the site, as opposed to contributors, don't need the folders. So I don't know if you noticed, but you can create folders, right? Uh, excuse me, views without folders. So if I go in here, notice I have a contributor view and a consumer view. So if I go into this document library, how many folders do you see when I go into the document library? None, None exactly. And that's because I've created a view that basically flattens this guy out, right? But if I go into the contributor view, Notice there's actually a folder structure behind the scenes, and the reason I do that is that if I have a contributor drill in to a folder structure and upload a document, SharePoint can contextually put you know, 8, 10, or whatever pieces of metadata just on two sublevels, right? Which is nice because then the consumer, who doesn't care about the folders, can then consume that. You should start thinking about how you do that now because you'll have actually better data when you actually roll this out in 2013, right? And in 2013, you can absolutely do this as well, and it works exactly the same way. So if I go into, for example, you know, default column values, where I can go in and actually set default column values, so I can actually go in and say, you know, what's the default category for this particular folder, right? And I can put in a metadata column, I can put in something else. Okay. So, yeah, question. Drag and drop. Yes, drag and drop. So, I mean, that's great, but then when the user drags it, there's no metadata. That's not true. In SharePoint 2010, I can drag and drop and get all the metadata I want. And here's why. If I create that folder structure, let's say I create Contoso, that's this folder, and then a subfolder called Project One. And then I say, in my document library, in Project One, I want default metadata of client equals Contoso, project equals Project One, city equals New York, because I know that's where Contoso is based, yada, 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 and I have 10 metadata fields. If I do that, and then I open Explorer View and drag and drop 10 documents, all 10 will have 10 perfectly filled out pieces of metadata. Done. Do try it, I swear, it works. Yes, so it does take work in creating default values, which is not trivial, right? But you do that once, right? And what we've done is we've actually created a PowerShell script where if I create like a new folder, it actually spins that up and just sets up all the default metadata for the user. So again, those little tiny things you can do to help the users, right? So, okay. Um, what else do we want to do? Let's talk about search. So search fixes everything. But before I talk about search, I actually want to talk about governance, just briefly. So my analogy around governance, and the, and the reason I want to talk about governance here is that you can't necessarily make people use metadata columns, right? And things like that. So what you want to do is you want to say, how do we decide what is something we force people to do, what is something that's optional, and what's in the realm of a user versus IT, right? So if you think about cars, anybody ever know what a car is, driven a car? Okay. Turn of the last century, so not this past century, which by the way, I feel really old because I say the turn of the century and I realize that means 12 years ago, right? Turn of the other century, like 112 years ago. Horseless carriages, right, called automobiles. There were actually no rules, 
right? There were a few, like horses didn't crash into each other, like you kind of, like boats, right? Like, please don't smash into each other. And the reason is, you know how fast horses and buggies go? Not that fast. And you know how many there are on the road? Not that many, right? So you basically had maybe some general rules, but it's just don't crash into the other horse kind of thing. And the horses already know how to do that. Yeah, yeah, you just say, hey, horse, you know, do what you, do what you know to do. Don't, you know. So you don't need any rules because the horse already knows what to do. They're alive, like you said. It didn't really matter. But guess what? When you put more and more cars on the road, guess what happens when there's no rules with lots of cars? Have you ever seen those movies from like the 1900s where there's cars going every which way and they crash into each other and people die, right? Sorry, I just depressed everyone. Think about SharePoint with no rules at all. Because governance, when I say governance, here's what people do. They either, how many people have no rules at all in their SharePoint environment? Just curious. No rules. You're lying. <laughs> ah, see, I knew it. How many people have so many rules that users are overwhelmed because you created a thousand page governance document? John, don't raise your hand. Um, okay, so everybody has a perfectly happy medium? No. I didn't think so. So here's the thing. You actually want to create just enough to see what happens and actually create order and then you know, slowly evolve over time. So you don't want to do nothing and you don't want to do the big bang approach. So if you think of the cars, drive on the right versus the left or left versus the right depending on where you're from and stop at, a stop, uh, stop at an intersection, right? So with those two rules, we can probably eliminate 99% of death in a car, right, with two rules. The idea in SharePoint is, again, you don't need to overwhelm users with 50 must-do things. Give them two. In fact, I'll even tell you to start with one. Anybody know what my one rule that I want people to start following is? Ride horses, Ride horses almost. <laughs> Fill out the title property in a document. And the reason is, that's what Search uses. And in fact, SharePoint 2013 fixes that problem, right? Because it actually knows. No, it doesn't actually. It still shows up as the wrong title. Even in 2013, even with the magic super code that you know, we saw this morning with Super Search, it actually still breaks. So really, you want to think of what are your rules of the road? What are the very simple things you want users to sort of must do? And you want to break it into three parts, right? So, you know, information management is we have the users do. Application management is, you know, how do we add a new lane to SharePoint, if you will, and then IT governance, right? How do we maintain it over time? So you want to split your governance up. But I just wanted to mention that what they do is they reduce risk and they make users happier, right? So it's, it's something you want to think about doing in the context of planning. All right, so search. The one thing I want you to do here is actually Reconcile your content sources. Are you searching the things you really want to search? Right? So if you plan for 2013, you want to think about what are you searching today, what do you want to search tomorrow? And then are you organizing content in hierarchies? So from your information architecture perspective, things that are organized in hierarchies and use natural language. So the word breaker, right? when search breaks the words up, uh, it's much better to have HTTP slash, you know, uh, collaboration slash sales slash report than it is to have, you know, collab, WAC, uh, SLS slash RPT, right? Because the problem is SharePoint will index those keywords and users will never ever type those in, for example. So you actually want to use, you know, regular English language for, for things like either folder structures or document names. Was there a question? Um, and you want to encourage rich and consistent metadata using the drag and drop and default uh, value and folder thing I mentioned, but the number one thing is title. Now, who thinks they can make every user put a title property in? Definitely. Nobody here. How many people use like the trick where you just take the file name and stick it in the title property with a little workflow or something? Yeah. If you can't get users to do that, I would almost highly recommend to make that happen. And here's why. Because search uses the title property to display the information. And so you have to make a judgment as an organization do we have trustworthy title properties or don't we? And it's hard to do because you have to do it globally to some extent, but you almost want to have that you know, epiphany and, and make that decision. So an example in search that you want to start thinking about today is if I go into, again, let's go into the 2010 environment to start. Let's say I was searching for that procurement document, right? So let's go back to where I started here, right? So let's go in and let's just do a search instead. This will, this will definitely find my document, right? Everybody, how many people think it'll find my document? Oh, come on, search is better than that. <laughs> okay, so guess what? Uh, my first two results are Death Star Plans and Timmy's School Project. How many people think search worked perfectly? It worked perfectly, actually. 
Because guess what? This first result is the government procurement notes document. That's actually the best algorithmically correct document for what I was asking for. Search worked perfectly. SharePoint 2010 search is great. Okay? The problem was the title property, if we go look in the library, so let's go in, let's go find where this is. It's actually in the shared documents Jan 2011 folder, right? So let's actually open this up. I'm just going to steal this here for lack of uh, a more sophisticated way to do it. Okay, so where's that document? Let's see, let's look through here, and there it is right there. Do you see the problem? The problem is the title property is Death Star Plans. So how does Death Star Plans get into the title of a document? What's the most likely way? Yeah, somebody had the Word document on their machine, and they made a copy of another Word document that they had two years ago when they worked for Lord Vader, apparently, right? <laughs> I don't know. And, and they redid it as, like, this week's sales report or something instead, and they uploaded it, right? And this happens all the time. Well, guess what? SharePoint's not smart enough to try to fix it. Or is it? Actually, SharePoint tries to fix it. If it actually sees a whole bunch of blank or missing titles, or it actually sees the same title in like five results in a row, it actually tries to magically change the title on the fly in search results for you. Does everybody know that? It's a feature in, 20, in SharePoint 2010 called Optimistic Title Override. It's a great feature. And here's what it does. It says, I don't think your user put the right title in. I'm going to fix it for you temporarily just in the search results page so I give you a better indication of what this document probably is. And you know what it does? It reaches into the document and tries to find what it thinks is probably a better suited title. I swear, I kid you not, this is a real feature. So what it does is it goes in and it's usually like the first line or the first heading of the document and it sticks that in there. So here's the problem. Sometimes it's a good title because the user actually did a good job putting a title in or maybe accidentally did it and didn't realize they did it, right? It's either a, or it's a really bad one like Death Star Plans or it's something completely random that SharePoint made up because it felt like it. And here's the thing. It does it that way to try to make search better because SharePoint team knows that this is a big problem. Because notice that if I change, well, if I change this to a better title, that's what would actually show up in the search results. And, and you think, SharePoint 2013 must fix this, right? Everybody agree? Of course it will, right? So let's do the Tailspin Toys, uh, I don't know, merger document, right? So I'm in SharePoint 2013 right now. I'm going to do a search, and, and uh, it's working. Come on. All right. And what do we get? We get exact, wait a minute. We get the Death Star plans again. This is in SharePoint 2013, OK? Guess what? Algorithmically, it got exactly the right document again, and me as the stupid user left the old title in there from when I worked for Lord Vader or whatever, and it's still there in 2013. Is SharePoint search way better? Oh, yeah, right, in 2013, because look, it's giving me better information. If I hover over it, right, I get this little, like, I get this little thing that, that shows me a, a, a preview of it. I can go in, and if I have really good vision, I can actually read what that says, right, et cetera. So is it better in terms of can I figure out if it is the right document? Yes. Do I still have a problem if I don't fix the title? Oh, yeah. So before you go to 2013 and announce to the world that SharePoint search is fixed because you miraculously upgraded their life to 2013, go fix the data first. You guys good with that? So I wanted to do this, which is you guys saw some really sexy demos today, and I kind of wanted to break your heart a little bit. So no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. The demos are awesome, SharePoint 2013 is awesome, but there's still little things that you gotta do or the users, more importantly, gotta do. Yeah, over here. Why wouldn't you just change the search results page to show the file name as well as the title? Here's the thing. I love that idea. One of the things we've done time and time again is change like the CSS to map in the file name instead. But guess what? If you create an Office 365 tenant, right, or your business user does, they're not gonna go in there and start muddling with that, and they're going to get the wrong thing. No, but why did they do it with I, hey, whoa, I didn't write the product. <laughs> Ask them. I, whoa, hey. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a great question. Why didn't Microsoft say, wait a minute, this is a well-known issue, let's fix this? I'm just pointing out that it's not fixed in the way that you want to fix it. It's not wrong. It's actually doing exactly what it's supposed to do, right? OK. All right, let's, uh, let's do, you guys having fun? Oh, yeah. All right.
fine. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. All right. Okay, social features. We already talked about that they rely heavily on profiles. And how many people have had an issue with the user profile service in 2010? Anybody have an issue? All right. There's a couple issues. You can either have issues with the actual you know, provisioning of the service because of FIM. You know, it's, the dirty little secret is in 2010, the FIM version you get is actually a pre-release version. Yeah, got to love it. Still to this day. Um, but I won't mention that on, on camera. Um, too late. Um, but I love the options in 2013 where you actually can go back and just do a straight import. You can use FIM, full FIM if you want. You can do all kinds of things, right? The harder part is actually, if you're really going to do social seriously, right, for real, you want to get all those questions and compliance things and user profile properties and all that stuff down cold. So you're going to probably have to talk to HR. You're going to have to talk to legal. You're going to have to talk to the business. You're going to have to figure out how to make user profiles really nice with things like pictures and you know, well, let's go through the list. Here's my seven-step program, right? Identify the stakeholders. So do I need to get HR involved? Do I need to get legal involved? Do I need to get the business involved? Do I need to get the AD, uh, uh, you know, guy involved, right? Whoever that is, you know, those AD. Anybody an AD administrator, by the way? Whew. Okay. Because um, you know how they can be, right? right? Oh, sorry, guy over there. Um, you want to identify how the profile information is going to be used. So 2013 relies heavily on profile information. So you've got to be careful there. Directory services. Are you using LDAP, AD, HR? What are you using there? So you want to make sure you're identifying those probably in a better way than you have in the past. What properties do you include? What property details do you include? What's the visibility of those details? Right? How much can people personalize? And then... How much newsfeed stuff and personal document stuff you're going to use? Because with the SkyDrive Pro thing, everybody know what SkyDrive Pro is, right? It's basically the new name for your personal store in your MySite as a user. And that can either be on-premise that you guys control or in the cloud. And you get, I think, seven gigs right, in the cloud. So it's actually going to be, you're going to be in a position where you're going to have to start thinking about quotas and content databases for personal documents in a way that maybe you didn't have uh, before. And remember, my sites is still, to this day, kind of three key things, right? It's profiles, which you can deploy all by itself. It's personal sites, which is I can put a document or something else in there. And then it's all the social stuff. That still holds true in 2013 as it did in 2010. And you guys familiar with the permissions you can set on the user profile service application? There's three checkboxes. Those three checkboxes are basically create personal site, follow people, and use tags and notes. Use tags and notes actually goes away in 2013. Tags and notes is still there, but that, that permission is actually deprecated. It's not worse than deprecated. It's actually gone. Well, it's deprecated. So it's actually there in case you do an upgrade and you have 2010 notes, right? Which is what deprecated means. But what I did is I have a little uh, table here that says, if you want news feed, but you don't want people following, and you do want personal site creation, this is the combo that you set. So this is just when you, when you go to set the 2013 properties. Do that now. And by the way, if you only have one set or two set now, when you go to upgrade, it actually turns them all on by default. So be careful of that in 2013. All right, I'm actually not going to demo social. How many people have actually seen the social demo? I'm probably not going to go too far into it. But the idea is that you know, I can go in. Here's my news feed, right? I can go in and you know, I'm following three people, three documents, 25 sites. I can go in and say, oh, wow, I like that document or I like this person. You know, I can go in, check out this person's profile, start following them, et cetera. So the idea is that this news feed information, and I'm already following uh, this person, but we're, you know, we're in common with certain people. I can look at her news feed, et cetera. But the idea is that the important thing is this is stored in the, in the personal site, and that's really the big deal. All right, apps. At the very beginning of the session, I, noted, I uh, pointed out that apps really take over everything, including how users provision lists and libraries. Right? So you're going to have to define your app strategy. This is actually a big deal because you're going to have to start thinking about, well, what do I do with my farm and sandbox solutions? Because Microsoft is leaning heavily away from doing that. It's still supported, by the way. You might read things about sandbox going away and stuff like that. Both farm and sandbox are both supported in 2013. The idea, though, is that they may not be in the next release, let's say. Right? So I would get away from sandbox, start creating apps if you can, and then actually um, 
create full farm solutions if you have to, right? And that's an app strategy. We won't go into that. There are other great sessions on apps, and you guys aren't really mostly developers, I'm assuming. But you want to essentially, in short, design for the cloud moving forward. So almost treat your own offering as if it's an internal cloud, right? It's a private cloud. And that's the way Microsoft wants you to think about it. How many people treat their infrastructure like a private cloud today? Yeah, that's probably going to need to change. I'm just the messenger, don't kill me. OK. So how does the app store work? Real briefly, you've got the general public store, and you've got the app catalog, which is your internal private store. Users can actually be granted permission to install things from either one or the other or both. Right? That's the very short version. There are other great sessions you can go find to learn more about that. All right, so finally, here's my top 10 list of preparing your environment. So this is the hardcore dirty work of your farm itself. And this is the top 10 list of things I want you to do before you try to do you know, a database attach upgrade or anything like that, right? Before I mention them, you guys familiar with how to move to 2013? Anybody not familiar with how upgrade's going to work? Right? This is how upgrade's going to work. You create a brand new farm, 2013 farm. You take a copy of your old database from 2010. You set it to read only over here, and you move it over here in 2013. You say, SharePoint, upgrade this database. It upgrades the database and leaves the site collections in 2010 mode. And then the site collection admin says, OK, I'll go in and upgrade my site. Now, you actually have three options. You can do it as part of the database upgrade. You can say, convert all the site collections. You can leave it to the site collection admins. Or you can do them little by little through PowerShell, something like that. Right? So you have three options, really. But the idea is that you're trying to push the onus of the upgrade itself and the review of the content and the site to make sure it looks OK onto the site collection admin, which may or may not work in your organization. So be well aware of that. Um, and I won't go into this, but all this is saying is that SharePoint 2013 actually is running pretty much a side-by-side -side installation of 2010 and 2013. So apps can run, not apps, excuse me, sites can run in both places. So you've got two layout directories, two hives, right, a 14 and a 15, right? And you'll actually notice that when you, um, when you install 2013, you'll actually notice there are actually two hives si side by side that actually function simultaneously, which is interesting. Hey, time for a book giveaway. So this is my give you guys a break from death by PowerPoint. So let's just hang out for maybe a minute or two. And anybody want to win a book or two? Anybody? All right, so do not shout out the answer. Raise your hand if you know it. Uh, what is the magazine that featured the following characters, Goofus and Gallant? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I saw a hand go up over here. Uh, how about you way over in the back? I think you were the first. What, who, what, who is it? Highlights. Highlights. Is that right? Yeah. All right. You win the book, so you can get it after if you want. But you win both, actually. So you get this one now. And the other one's not done. It's in like Word format with a bunch of red lines and stuff. So you'll get it when it's done uh, shortly. Shortly. I want to make sure it's good, you know, quality over timeliness, I guess, or something like that. Uh, all right, so here's my top 10 list, finally. Delete unused or underused site collections, right? You improve performance and reduce risk this way. So if you're not doing it now, start doing that. Start doing regular maintenance. It's like cleaning your room, right? You don't leave the dirty dishes out. You start cleaning that up. Check your large lists. Again, you know the throttling in 2010? for over 5,000 That works exactly the same way in 2013, right? So you're going to want to look at your large lists and figure out what to do with them. Should they go in a real database? Should you educate your users? Should it be partitioned into multiple libraries or folders? What's interesting is folders have three great uses. Even though I'm a big proponent of get rid of folders, they actually have three great uses. One is permissioning. Two is actually the default property thing that I mentioned before for contribution. The third one is actually for partitioning large libraries, because you can actually fit millions of documents in a single document library if you partition it correctly. And I've done it, and it works great. Number eight, delete excess columns from wide lists. Basically, a wide list is where you add lots and lots and lots of columns to the, in, a, in a list or a library to the point where SharePoint actually has to bubble over into separate structures in the actual database. This can actually cause upgrade to fail altogether. So you want to keep your eye on these. And you might not know where they exist because users might be doing it without your knowledge. Right? All right, number seven, consider moving site collection to a separate database. Anybody know why? Here's the why. In SharePoint 2010, you know the software boundaries, all that stuff? Anybody? Yeah? 
15,000 site collections was the software boundary for a content database. In SharePoint 2013, it actually doesn't go up. It actually goes down to 5,000. So if you're one of those lucky people that have more than 5,000 site collections in a single database, your upgrade will actually fail for this reason as well. Okay? Remove extraneous document versions. Again, large numbers of versions actually kill an upgrade. So it doesn't mean go out and delete them out from your users, right? But go take a peek and work with your uh, business people. Remove unused web parts and templates and things like that. Again, this is a platform hygiene thing. I'm a big fan of platform hygiene, which is there's enough, I was going to say something bad. There's enough bad things that could go wrong in a SharePoint environment. Let's not tempt fate by leaving things that aren't necessary out there, right? Anybody ever use PowerPoint broadcast sites in SharePoint? Anybody? Anybody even know what it is? All right, so never mind. Um, <laughs> visual upgrades. Anybody actually do a, 20, uh, a 2007 to 2010 upgrade? Anybody still have sites that are in 27, uh, 2007 mode, basically? Okay, here's what's going to happen. When you upgrade those from 2010 to 2013, it'll just automatically convert those all to 2010 experience, which may be the behavior you want. Maybe that's fine. But you want to make sure the owner of those sites are well aware that that's going to happen because it may break their site or something like that, right? So it may be a better option to say, let's move all those to make sure they're all in 2010 mode, and then we'll actually upgrade to 2013, which, by the way, leaves them in 2010 mode until the site collection admin puts them into 2013 mode. Does that make sense? I think I just confused everyone. Okay. Number two, check databases for duplicate and orphan site collections. There's actually STS, ADM, and, and uh, PowerShell commands to look for orphan site collection things. Again, clean those up. Don't let those linger for a long time. And then finally, health analyzer issues. Again, don't do, you know, it, go home right now and clean those all up. Of course, there's one false positive, right, which is the user profile service application. If you have it configured correctly, you'll have one error. Um, but everything else you should clean up. And then my step zero, which is sort of the bonus step, is have a beer. Everybody sound good then? No, here's what I mean by that. Relax, have a beer, go call some of your business users, some of the invested parties that, that care about SharePoint and maybe want 2013. Sit down with them, go to a bar, do some, and just talk through like what's working, what's not, what do you like, what would you like to see? Because that's actually going to help you more than anything. Because if there's things that work or don't work, the things that don't work, you're going to have a much better time if you're actually in a constant dialogue with the business community that's actually consuming this stuff. All right, so that's my five things to prepare for now, right? Five things as in five categories of things. Um, OK, so what did we go through? Well, we went through a bunch of things. And let's talk about Bob. We forgot all about Bob. Richard, you didn't forget about Bob, no. So his SharePoint journey looks something like this. He deployed, you know, 2007. He upgraded to 2010. He's sort of thinking about 2013. In 2010, he switched on social in 2010, but it sort of didn't go anywhere. He switched on search, but everybody said it still didn't work very well, right? There's probably not a lot of site governance and love, ongoing love. Basically, he wants to use the 2013 upgrade as an opportunity to fix these things. And I'm hoping some of the things that I mentioned today will help you actually when you deploy 2013, not just have a new version out there, but have a better performing version. And what I mean by performing is not necessarily fast, but quality of content, et cetera. All right, so what about your journey? So the journey that I've seen most people take is you want to roll out your initial deployment, right, which is Teams, intranet, improve access to information. The next place you want to go before you get too broad is really just what I call controlled empowerment. Right? So this is where the governance kicks in, which is just a well-organized model for content management and delivery. Think about enforcing the title property, using default properties, doing some of these little tiny things that make a huge difference in terms of content quality. And then go after advanced workloads, right? So things like you know, compliance and you know, deprovisioning notes and file net and putting them into SharePoint and doing all these crazy things, right? You want to make sure you have a sound plan. Uh, um, you know, foundation before you uh, go crazy on SharePoint. And then really the, the sort of highest level is more business critical solutions. I'm seeing more and more folks use SharePoint to tie it into ERP, tie it into CRM, tie it into other things. And the new app model is something you're going to have to be careful and be aware of, as well as that access services thing I mentioned before. So if you stop by our booth, by the way, we're actually doing a survey about where folks are in their SharePoint journey, if you will. 
And we're actually, we're not giving away a Kindle Fire HD. We upgraded that to a Microsoft Surface. So if you're interested in winning a Surface, um, you can just swing by the booth. It's literally five questions. And we're just compiling some information about where people are. And then we're actually going to uh, send everybody, you know, kind of what everybody answered and give you some feedback on that. So if you're interested in both participating and entering to, um, you know, to try to win, because we're, uh, we're giving it away at the end of the week. So, so anyway, here's, uh, here's Bob's SharePoint journey. Before he rolls out social, what should he do? Get his profiles in order, right? Active Directory hygiene. And what that means is making sure when the manager changes, the manager field changes, because that's going to affect SharePoint. Little things like that are going to impact how well social is perceived by the company. Photos, do you have a business need for social, or is it just an experiment, right? Not until you have those check marked should you even roll out social. Same with search, you have the title property licked, right? So don't declare victory until that happens. And if you have to run a PowerShell command to change everybody's title so that it's the same as the file name and then have a workflow that automatically sets it, Fine, do it that way, but just do something so that you educate users on why it works that way. Adoption, again, checklist there, business solutions checklist there. Basically, at the end of the day, SharePoint is not a destination, right? It's a journey. You have to give it ongoing love and maintenance. It's not the payroll system that you install once. It just works the same way every week, and you're done, right? It is a living, breathing thing that needs constant care and, and feeding. And if you, know, if you need more money or something in your department and your boss says, eh, it's just SharePoint, you know, I'll write a note and say, yeah, you give Bob more money, right? Because it needs more love to be better, right? All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go make the most of your investment today. I want you to understand what's new in SharePoint. I want you to prepare and take action today. Don't wait a year when you're about to upgrade. And then evaluate where you are in your journey. And by the way, Bob is happy because he came to our session, did everything I said. And, uh, and why is he happy, by the way? Not because he came to the session, it's because his users are happy. And by the way, because his users are happy, he get a raise. And, uh, and that's all I have. So hopefully you enjoyed the session. Question? Yeah, question. Does Access Services have a software development life cycle? Access Services, does it have a software development life cycle? Um, uh, Sort of, you have to invent it, right? I mean, you have a good point, which is you basically do that in production, is the answer. Because it's not development, it's content. So we can have the conversation about what's content versus code. In this, in this context, my, uh, SharePoint's treating it as content, but you have a great point there, which is it's non trivial, right? For code, you have a life cycle process. For content, you have a life cycle process. And then you're just going to figure out which one it goes into. Yeah, so it's a great question. I'm not going to give you the answer right now in, in one sentence because it's more complex than that, unfortunately. So, uh, thank you. Oh, wait, actually, if you have questions, if you could go to the mic. Uh, actually, two questions. One on the SharePoint profiles. When you said that that all the social data is going into their their my site, what happens when that user gets deleted? What happens to all that social data also as it's been linked and connected to other stuff? Yeah, the, their social data is, is still there in the content database until you decide to get rid of it. Okay. Um, and then the second one, all the preparation steps, was that mainly for collaboration sites or does that also apply to publishing sites? Uh, you mean my top ten list? Yeah. Publishing sites as well. Yep. Great question. So does Bob go to the cloud for 2013, or do they deploy on site? Well, that's only for you to decide, right? I mean, I think the answer is you get, it, 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 what, do you want to, what, what do you want to be doing as an organization and focusing your time on, right? So do you want to focus on managing the environment? And there are benefits, right, that go along with that, which is control and things like that. Or are you, are you trusting enough of Microsoft to say, you know what, I can relinquish that responsibility and let them do that for me? So I think it's really a, an organization by organization decision on a number of factors. And one of the things we do, not to pitch us too much, but we do cloud assessments for companies where we, they ask us that question and we'll actually do like a pro and con list and then we'll fit, sit down. And some of it is cost savings, right, which is cheaper. And some of it is yeah, but I don't trust, you know, not managing my stuff directly, so I want to, you know, so it depends. So I think it's a long answer. So functionality yeah, so functionality features, here's the downside. You cannot, in the cloud, install a farm solution. So if you've got t 
a lot of internal code that your developers have written that, that require a farm solution, meaning it's not just some JavaScript or something, you can't install that in Office 365. If you want to make heavy use of the content search web part because you love it, it's not on and it will be on someday, but it's not on today, for example. If you want to do things like, um, I can't think of many other examples, you know why? Because in 2010, there was feature um, differences, right, where you could do a lot more. In 2013, the feature parity is actually really good. It's, in, in fact, 2013 will be the first release where the cloud will actually get features before the product will, right? So that debate, which is, hey, it doesn't work in the cloud, is actually a lot less than it used to be, and it's mainly around custom solutions that I've coded myself. And the answer to that is you write an app, right? And you write an iframe app. I know we're going back to like 1998 or something. But the idea is that I don't write my app in SharePoint. I write it in Azure. I write it with Visual Studio. I can write millions of lines of code if I feel like. And then I provide it out as a web UI that SharePoint then consumes, and it looks like it's part of SharePoint because it's a SharePoint app. Does that make sense? So basically what you need to start thinking about if you do a lot of internal development is you have to change the way that internal development is done. Instead of relying on the deployment on a server, it's thinking about how I write those a little bit differently. And I know it's, it's probably not an IT pro thing. It's more of a developer thing. But really, it's an IT as a, as a whole needs to start thinking about their approach on their architecture. Does that answer your question? Yeah. As, uh... Microsoft made an improvement in terms of web analytics in 2013? Web analytics. So, um, yeah, search. By the way, before anybody, uh, before I forget, make sure you fill out your evals. Uh, I know um, I'm supposed to remind you, so I will. So, um, web analytics. So, web analytics as a service application actually goes away, um, but search replaces it. So, it's still there, it's just a little bit different. But um, there is a lot more there that you can get. And the reason is, site collection administrators can get a lot more information than they ever could, which is good. And one of the reasons that's the case is that when Office 365 goes into place, right, I, as a tenant of that, right, I can't get to the service application to look at the reports, but I can get to my site collection. So then I can actually get site collection level reports. So the reports are actually better for end users and site owners than they have been, actually. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, let's put it this way, you might still need web trends for certain things. That was probably your real question. It doesn't replace it altogether. But, but it is better in some places. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the auto classification Sorry. possibilities of, of folders. Yep. You didn't reference global content types at all, and that's kind of a big deal for the upgrade. Then yep. The other question I have is the power of integrating with Exchange is the game changer for this upgrade, in my view. What, from a migration path consideration, do I need to? taken, you can say, I'm going to upgrade them both, Yep. what order and what are the implications? Yeah, good question there. So because we only had an hour, right, uh, you bring up a really good point, which is if you think the whole, like, hey, we do projects and they involve email, so this is a big deal for us, right, which you said, then that is a major upgrade consideration. I think the big thing there is just really not that big a deal, and here's why. What's going to happen is you're going to upgrade Exchange and all the personal mailboxes. You're going to upgrade SharePoint and all the sites and everything. It'll actually be the same. When you create a new project, let's say, which is a new site, you'll get a site mailbox along with it. And all that's going to do is provision a new mailbox in Exchange that's named the, the site name. Okay? Then you actually have two content stores that basically stay in sync with each other. Do I get that site mailbox when I upgrade each site? No. You will not get a site mailbox magically when you upgrade SharePoint from 2010 to 2013. You'll only get it when you go to, uh, uh, when you create a new site in 2013, right? Now you have an option here. If you have a 2010 site, you can upgrade that to a 2013 mode and then say, I want a site mailbox that goes along with this. So you can do that, right? And I think that maybe is your question. So it's really not that big a deal from an implication, but it's just, you probably want to upgrade them together if you want to use that feature because it depends on both, right? So it's, it's really not that complex at the end of the day. Oh, so content types. So content types actually work very similarly as they did before. Um, have you used the content type hub in 2010? So I'm actually doing a content type session on Thursday. So if you could just come to that session, we'll answer all your questions there. <laughs> How's that for a cop-out answer? 
Question over here. I like the discussion about Holder. Yeah. Now, what do you mean by the functional limitation of subfolders? Give me well, specifics. Maybe take that offline because I'm not exactly sure what you're, you're referring to. I haven't run into that specific situation, so maybe I just haven't done it. So uh, I think that's it. So thank you very much.